you, O Lord, are not far away. O my help, you come quickly to my aid. I will tell of your name to my brothers and sisters in the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise the Lord. Glorify God and stand in awe of God. For the Lord did not despise or abhor the affliction of the afflicted. God did not hide God's face from me, but heard when I cried. This is Disciples Net. Thank you so much for joining us today. Let us prepare our hearts for worship. Will you join me today in prayer? Loving God, we come before you today as children, sheltered in your love, blessed by your grace, and seeking your wisdom to guide us when we fall short of doing your will. Forgive us for our failure to love, to serve the wounded, to rise above our differences and celebrate the variety in your creation. We thank you that today you give us strength and another day to try and live up to your vision for us. We ask especially that you be with those who are suffering, whether from hunger, from illness, from natural disasters, from homelessness, or from loneliness. Please meet them in their time of need and give them comfort and hope. Guide those who lead us. Provide them with a glimpse of your vision of a world at peace where all have enough to live, where your people dwell together in peace. And when they receive that vision, give them wisdom to help us work together toward that goal, a planet where all share in the care of the land and all its people. We pause now in a moment of silence to offer our individual prayers for those concerns that are near to our own hearts. Finally, we praise you, Holy One, for the gifts you have given and continue to give each day. The wonder of your amazing creatures, the sounds of a living planet, the beauty of the land around us, the touch of loving human hands, the taste of the foods we love, the grace to perform acts of kindness. Truly, you are an awesome God. Watch over us this week as we go forth as your servants. Give us the strength to meet the tasks set before us, the love to keep giving, 
the power that comes from faith in you, and the steadfastness to continue the journey on which you have sent us. We ask these things in the name of your Son, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Our scripture today comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, verses 17 through 31. As Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to the man, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. The man said to Jesus, Teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go, sell what you own and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. When the man heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said to one another, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God, all things are possible. Peter began to say to him, Look, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly, I tell you, there is no one who has left house for brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age 
houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children, and filled with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. May God add His blessings to our hearing and our understanding of this word. Amen. Some years ago, my wife Susan had an extended business trip in Strasbourg, France, and during the time she was there, my daughter and I had the opportunity to go and visit for a few days. And one of the things that happened, I think it was the first night we were together, we had actually parked our car in a forbidden parking spot. That's really embarrassing because we both speak enough French that we should have read the signs and understood. But we parked at a bus stop. We came back to the car after going out to dinner. Our car was gone. We managed to get, I think we took a taxi back to the hotel, where Henri, who was the concierge at the Strasbourg Hilton Hotel at the time, explained to us what had probably happened and what we had to do in order to get our car out of impound. And it cost $140. We were devastated. And when we got back from that horrible experience of recovering our car, Henri was trying to be so sympathetic. And he was trying to tell us not to let something like this ruin our time together on this vacation. And he tried to comfort us by suggesting, You are each! And life is short. Well, I think you could tell by the look on my face that I wasn't buying that. And then he altered his thought just a bit, and he says, Well, maybe you are not rich, but you are rich enough. And you know, we probably were rich enough not to let that one incident ruin our entire vacation. And it actually was pretty good advice. The story we have in Scripture today is one that the church tradition has labeled the rich young ruler. Actually, we know from the version of the story we see today that this man had many possessions. So Mark tells us that he is rich. Mark doesn't tell us that he is young. Mark doesn't tell us that he has any kind of political power as a ruler. Those two pieces of the story come from Matthew's and Luke's version of the same story. But we have all become comfortable over the years calling him the rich young ruler. And it is one of those troubling stories. Jesus brings out of this event a teaching that is a bit troubling for us. I've heard one preacher say that there are stories and teachings in the Bible that make her think, what's that again, Lord? Is that really what you mean? What's that again? I wonder if Jesus really, seriously, intends for everybody who has possessions to sell them and give everything we have to the poor. Most people tell us our whole economic system would collapse if we did that. I wonder if Jesus really intended us to do exactly that, or if he was using this situation to give a different kind of teaching. I think the real problem for this man was that he had actually, rather than owning his possessions, he had actually entered into relationship with them. Now, if you think about it, most of us have a concept of how that really works. There are certain things that we own, but it doesn't feel like we own them. They own us almost as much as we own them. It's like we've entered into a true reciprocal relationship with something which should simply be a possession. Remember how you felt about your first automobile. Remember how much of your time and energy and how much money it took to keep it running to enjoy it, to keep it clean, and it was, sometimes it almost took as much as it gave, and it was more of a relationship than an ownership situation. I, all of us have things like that in our lives. Sometimes I feel that my house makes more demands upon me than it gives back to me. Uh, I have a relationship with bricks and mortar and wood siding and paint. It's not an ownership situation. I have known people 
such as our friend Dean Phelps, who does so much music for DisciplesNet, have that kind of relationship with a guitar, which should simply be a possession. I think he calls it Sarah. But who owns whom is a legitimate question for us. Possessions, wealth, let's be simple and blunt, money. Money is a wonderful servant. It is amazing what can be accomplished with it if we claim it and use it. But it is an insidious and cruel master. What Jesus was actually doing that day was challenging this ruler, I'm sorry, challenging this wealthy man to take genuine control of his possessions. They clearly had too much claim on his life. He did not really own them. It's like they took as much as they gave. The truth is, my friends, if you cannot let go of it, if you cannot give it away, you don't truly own it. I believe that same message can be given to a local church, a congregation, maybe even Disciples Net, if we are honest and think about it. The church also has obligation. I say church, I mean a local congregation or Disciples Net. We have an obligation to have a stewardship attitude about our own possessions and resources. The things that we have, are they for our own benefit as an organization or as a group? The things that we have, are they instead resources for the ministry of Jesus Christ? Are they objects of stewardship or are they genuine, simple possessions for us? I think a local church, I think Disciples Net, has to answer a question like that just like an individual does. Very often we hear someone say in regard to a Bible story like this one, yes, but stewardship is more than money. Well, stewardship is more than money, but stewardship is never less than money. I think we all understand that it's more than money, but I don't think we want to use that as an excuse just because we are uncomfortable talking about money. We don't want to leave that subject too quickly. You see, I think every minister has had the experience of hearing someone say, money's not very important to me, or money doesn't mean very much to me. And what we really know we are hearing when someone uses that language is, financial stewardship doesn't mean very much to me. You can't count on much of a gift from me to the church. Yes, stewardship is more than money, but if we are trying to make that point just because we're uncomfortable talking about money, I think we better take time to notice where that boat is really going before we jump on it. Because if we take seriously the concept that stewardship is more than money, it makes this whole teaching more difficult and not easier. For example, let's say that financial stewardship, giving money to the church or to the poor or to other things that I care about. Let's say that that's not a problem for me. Let's say that giving money to the church is actually, I find it easy to be generous with my money. Does that mean that I'm okay? Does that make me off the hook? Does that mean that the hard teaching of Jesus in this story is not for me? No, it does not. Because the truth is, there is something in my life that means to me what material possessions meant to the man in this story. Something that is so important that giving it up is too much. It actually interferes with my relationship with God. There is something like that in my life. And if you are leaning toward your screen this morning wanting to hear me tell you about it, I'm not sure I care to share that with 4,000 of my dearest and closest friends in 200 countries just now. Thank you so much for your interest. But there is such a thing in my life. And I think if you are honest, you will acknowledge that there are things like that in your life so important that giving it up 
is just too much. Something that demands so much loyalty, so much love from you, that it is in first place when it really should not be. We all have things or people or ideas in our lives that are so big for us that we might not be able to give them up, even if the Savior himself asks for it. Things so important that they can actually get in the way can become a hindrance to our relationship with Jesus Christ and to Almighty God. If any of that is true for you, and I confess that it is for me, then today's teaching and today's Bible story is for you. And it is for me, even if we are generous with our money. Yes, stewardship is more than money, but it's never less than money. Even the teaching of this story is about more than money. It is about a much broader type of discipleship and commitment, which of course is what stewardship is really about. After all, discipleship and commitment. And if we really believe that stewardship is about more than money, if we really believe that it is about discipleship and commitment, then I invite you to do this right now. I invite you to take just a moment and think back and try to revisit the moment when you first said yes to Jesus Christ. Perhaps when you were baptized, the promises that you made, the thoughts that were in your head at that time, the emotions that were inside you at that time. I invite you to go back and revisit that moment just, just for a second or two right now and remember what it meant to offer all that you are and all that you have to our Lord and Savior and to our God. Perhaps we are not rich, but we are rich enough. Amen. Many churches that serve communion will do it in a tray filled with little cups such as this one. And it's interesting as I've had the opportunity to serve the trays down the rows sometimes to watch as people will sometimes scan over the tray and then carefully choose the cup that's most full. Sometimes one will also see someone choose the least filled cup so they'll save the more full one for others. But as we come to this table time and again, I 
believe that we are intended to learn at this meal, at this feast we've been invited to. And we learn that it's not so much in the actual substance of the juice, the blood, the wine, and the bread, that we are rich. But our wealth comes at this table in the very fact that we are invited. The invitation makes us rich. And I think as we come time and again, we're left to contemplate, to marvel at that wealth that we have. And so my friends, we come once again. Won't you join me in prayer? Dear God, as we come to you now, we give profound and humble thanks that you would invite us here. We thank you for the richness of this table that's been spread throughout the centuries where Jesus bids us all come and gives us that invitation. We ask now that you bless the bread and the cup that's here as symbols of your love for us, of Jesus' life and death for us. We ask that you see each person listening here and bless the bread and cup this with them, whether it's physical or held in their minds. Help us to grow into greater understanding each day, each time we come here, of the mystery of your love and the kingdom, the realm of God, that's there for us each to participate in now and forevermore. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. For it was on that last night, as Jesus was eating with his disciples, that he took a loaf of bread. And after he had blessed it, he broke it and said to them, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after they had finished eating, he took the cup, and poured it out and said to them, This cup is the new covenant of my blood poured out for you. For as often as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you show forth the Lord's love, you tell the Lord's story until he comes again. Won't you come now, my friends, and eat and drink? And now may we go into the world filled with the Spirit of Jesus Christ and Almighty God. May we go reaching out in love 
to our brothers and sisters everywhere. Amen.